Hi everyone, thank you for joining our webinar on Hops Works Future Store for Kubeflow and on-premise clusters. And tonight I will be hosting the webinar and Jim will present, be presenting. We also have Fabio Busso from our engineering team answering questions, so feel free to send all your questions on the chat and he will do the, his best to answer all as many as we can. Uh, just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and you all receive the video uh, after the webinar has ended. Uh, thank you so much and now I'll pass along to Jim. Hi, right, thanks Natalia. And good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. I'm gonna talk today about the Hopsworth Feature Store and how you can use it from Kubeflow, but also from any on-premise cluster, in particular one that is Spark enabled like Hadoop, so Cloud Era uh, typically. And I'll just get started by saying who we are. So we're a company called Logical Clocks, and here's some of the people involved. Uh, I'm one of them there. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about what a feature store is. And the journey many of you will be going on is that maybe you're interested in doing machine learning at scale or in production. And you maybe have some existing scripts or jobs that you use to generate features. <clears throat> and you've probably come across the idea that you could share potentially feature engineering jobs um, across many different models that you're training. And you may have read about existing feature stores that, that, that provide platform support for sharing the feature engineering, but also for serving the features, both for training and for, for, for online applications. And the feature store, I'm gonna talk about it, it's an offline and online feature store, and we'll get to what that is later on. But you probably have come here because you've heard about existing hyperscale AI companies having a feature store. So I think Uber, Michelangelo was the first platform that anybody talked about in any kind of, uh, uh, depth, and th that was quite a while ago, it's two years ago now. But we now have maybe about 20 different companies who've talked publicly about their feature stores, pretty much all hyperscale AI companies. There's a good reference there, featurestore.org, if you want to see videos um, about many of these existing feature stores. Our platform is called Hopsworks, it's a feature store. It's the world's first open source and still the only fully open source feature store. It's open source in that all the layers, so all the database, the file system, the metadata, even the jobs for computing it, everything is open source there. We'll get to it later on, but the, the connectors that we do provide are actually part of the enterprise version of the platform or our SaaS platform called Hopsworks AI. But otherwise, if you do your feature engineering in Hopsworks and you do your training in Hopsworks, everything is open source and you can go ahead and use it. Um, because we're talking about Kubeflow, I'll mention uh, Google Cloud Platform and Gojek Feast, which is a, a feature store available on, on uh, GCP. And uh, it's layered on top of BigQuery. Um, they've re recently kind of moved from Bigtable to uh, uh, Redis uh, as an online feature store. Um, but it's, it, it, that was it, their current iteration is influenced by the Hopsworks uh, design. So uh, we'll get to that later. It's a, a data set, a, a data frame API to our feature store. Okay, so this is the first intro slide to just tell you what the feature store is from my perspective, from a high level. It's this API or this interface between engineering, so we call it interface or API between data engineering and data science. It's a platform that sits between your back-end data engineers up here and your data scientists down here. So the data scientists down at the bottom, this DS, they train models and they go to the feature store to get their features. Um, if there are features that are not available in the, in the feature store, they'll talk or maybe help these data engineers up here to compute those features or get those features from back-end platforms, online uh, operational databases, uh, from data lakes, um, from you know, uh, Kafka brokers, and wherever that data is going to come from, um, they'll try and make that data, uh, featureize that, that data and make it available then for training and models. So um, what value does a feature store give you? Well, if you're only gonna train a couple of models, um, probably not a huge amount, but as you invest in more features in your feature store and as you add more curated features to your feature store, so we can see down here as we add more, we go in this direction, 
the cost of doing a machine learning project should decrease because you don't have to do the 80% of feature engineering and drudge work of getting the data from your backend platforms, cleaning it up and so on. That, that work, hopefully, a lot of it will have been done already because the features are there already. So Uber, I think, have mentioned that they have over, uh, I think it's over 30,000 features in their feature store, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we have customers with up to uh, with several hundred or a thousand, and um, you get a lot of value from, from just those levels, of course, as well. So I'm going to start at the start. What is a feature? Uh, a feature is, is it's some input to a, a machine learning model. It's the data that goes in. So it's this thing here. You can see it's represented as a vector. We often use the term feature vector, the vector being the set of feature values. But the features that you input into a model, they should have some predictive value. Otherwise, what's the point, right? If it's just random data, it's not going to help you make this prediction. And uh, um, this, is a, this is the training of our model that we're, we're computing the loss over our training data set. And then later on, when we have a model, we'll use that model to make predictions. So features are input. It's data that comes into your model. It should have some predictive value. Let's have a look at an example. And this is an example that brings us between the API of the data engineering backend that's over here. This is our backend. We have some raw hotel bookings in our operational database. We can see that this room was booked between the 22nd and 27th of May, and it was room number 23. And here's another booking for room number 23 from the 29th of May to the 31st. So this is all nice, um, but what we'd like to have is a feature which tells us what is the load factor in the month of May? We have this load factor here. Because we think that that load factor will help, help us make predictions. It might help us predict uh, whether the rooms will be booked or whether this is a good room or a bad room or whether we should increase the price. There are many different models we could train around that particular feature. So feature engineering, as we call it, is about transforming this backend data into the features that will be used to make predictions. So these are the features that we're going to store in the feature store. So uh, our feature store will actually catch this load factor and it'll make it available for online and offline applications. So, so you can have an application that needs to pull that feature out in real time, you can go to the feature store and get it. But also if I'm going to train a model, I can get that feature, the load factor for, for my training data for my model. So our feature store, uh, the Hopsrick feature store, introduces uh, three concepts that it builds on. So we have a, a slightly different way of doing feature stores. If you're familiar with Michelangelo or um, Airbnb's feature store zipline, they talk a lot about their DSLs, uh, that's a domain specific language for doing these feature transformations. So we, we, we have a general purpose platform, we have a data frame API. So Pandas, Python, Spark, PySpark are the typical ways in which you write the feature engineering code. Um, but once you have your features engineered and, 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 and uh, made available, we will store them in the feature store uh, as data frames. So we're going to cache this data. So the abstractions that we introduce are the features themselves, but also the groups or data frames in which they come into the feature store. So here's an example that's a well-known problem from data science. We call the Titanic passenger problem. You're trying to predict whether a given passenger survives on the Titanic or not. And uh, let's play a, a, you know, a, a thought, a, a kind of uh, a game and pretend that some historian has found some new data source, the, the bank account information for the passengers. And they put that data into the feature store. They've got the name of the passenger and the amount of money they had. And now our feature store has two different feature groups, one with the passengers in the Titanic and another one with their bank account detail, the amount of money they had in their banks at the time of the Titanic sinking. The data scientist can go along and say, OK, I can browse the feature store, look at these features, and I can join them together to uh, create a new what we call training test data set. Now, this looks quite complex, what you can see here. And we'll see in the next slide that the code is very simple. Um, but what a data scientist is doing is basically taking features and reusing them. So some of these features may be used in many different models, but in our particular feature store, you can reuse the features to create new training and test data sets. So the data scientist says, I want to join all of these features together, the, the, the ones in the Titanic passenger list, and add to it the bank account balance. 
And the feature store will be smart enough when you try and join them together to find the common join key, the name of the passengers. You can, of course, explicitly specify that yourself, but we have a query planner that will try and find it for you. And when the data scientists have done that, they need to decide, okay, what will I do with this, this training test data set? You can get it back as a data frame and use it directly in, in, in your applications to train models. If it's not a huge amount of data, you could use it in scikit-learn uh, as a pandas data frame. But if it is a large amount of data, or if you're going to train a model for deep learning with GPUs, you typically want to take this training test data and store it on a file system or object store. So you might want to say, I'm going to work in TensorFlow. I would like the data in the TF record file format, and I would like it to be stored on Google Compute Storage Engine, so GCS, or S3 if you're on Amazon. Or maybe if you're on an on-premise cluster, store it on HDFS. Uh, now, TF record is, is the native file format for TensorFlow, but if you're working with PyTorch, you might want done NPY files, NumPy files, or CSV files for scikit-learn. Um, there are about 50, 10 different file formats that we support in the platform. And these abstractions, the features of feature groups and training data sets, they're all versioned. And they're versioned so that we can reproduce training data sets. So if later on we have a model and we discover a problem with it, maybe it has bias, and we want to go back and say, okay, can we recreate the training test data set for this model? In our particular platform, you can. Um, but uh, in other cases, you often will archive your training test data sets so that, that you can link them back to the models. In our case, you can recreate them. Uh, so the feature groups are the abstraction we're building on. And um, what kind of examples do you have of feature groups? Well, we have low latency feature groups, so features that come in in real time. These are uh, real time data. We have other feature may come from uh, Kafka topics, event data from a, an operational SQL database. Maybe we're going to replicate it out um, with, with, a, you know, with, with some sort of engine like the Devenium. And then we might have a data warehouse or a data lake. So depending on what type of um, features they are, they will come in at different rates. They'll be ingested to the feature store at different cadences. So real-time features that maybe come in from a user entering uh, something on a web page. So maybe they're looking to make an insurance claim and they enter a, a, a bunch of information, but we need to transform that information into features. If it's strings, we might need to one hot code them. Um, if it's numbers, we might need to normalize them and uh, you know zero mean them. And sometimes we do have cases where we can't materialize that data directly in the feature store. So in that, in that case, some real-time features might go directly uh, and be computed within the app. But the vast majority of features that you will encounter can be materialized or stored in the feature store. So things like uh, how many clicks has a user done in the last 10 seconds or five seconds? Um, give me the changes to your database with this, from the CDC API to your database. Um, what's happened to the user profile in the last hour or what kind of information has come in in the last day? Um, so all these different types of features that, 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 that arrive in at different rates or cadences and um, we can store in the feature store, which is great because then these online applications that need the features, what they can do is they can actually uh, pull their features out and say, hey, I was only, I've, I've only got a few different uh, pieces of information about the user, maybe their ID, their shopping cart. I need another hundred features uh, with this user ID and with this shopping cart ID, this session ID, uh, please give me back those. And the feature store will do that. And the feature store will also be able to take uh, a data scientist request to generate some training data, training and test data sets. Or maybe you have an analytical application, a batch application that will use a model to make predictions. It can go to the feature store and say, hey, give me these features. I don't want to make predictions on them. So the problem here for feature store designers is that there's no existing database that can give you the requirements that you typically have. So the online application needs its features in less than 10 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds. And um, with customers, we've had up to 40, 40 terabytes of features for just one model. So it needs to be a scalable um, store, but it also needs to be very low latency and we need to reuse features. So we need things like joins, we need low latency access to data, but we also need to be scale out. So what we do, and I think every other existing feature store does is, we break up the feature store into two parts, an online feature store, that's for serving the features, in low latency, and then an offline or scalable, in our case, a scalable SQL feature store, which is Apache Hive. So we're using Apache Hive for the offline feature store and MySQL cluster 
as an in-memory um, distributed, highly available database for the online feature store. Um, yeah, the last point to make here is that there is one, one uh, incidental piece of complexity that arrives when you do break them up. It's that the data now needs to be synchronized between both the online and offline feature stores. Um, that's a bit of a problem because if we had one system, we just push it in once and the features will be engineered. Now we need to push the engineered features into both the online and the offline feature store. And that would be a good bit of work if you did it directly against the databases. But what we do is we provide an API for this, a data frame API, and your application, which could be written in Spark or in Python. So it could use Pandas for a Python application, or it could use PySpark and the data frame in PySpark to do your feature engineering, or it could be a Spark streaming application. All of these applications will do the feature engineering from the back end data here, and they'll push their features into the feature store as data frames. And then inside the, data, inside the feature store, we have these feature groups that we talked about earlier. And now users don't need to worry about offline or online feature stores, you just have feature groups. And it's up to the platform to manage that the data gets replicated to both the online and offline feature store and kept, con kept consistent between them. So, um, yeah, so this general purpose uh, data frame API helps us simplify ingestion of the features into the online and offline feature stores. So let's have a look at, at code for doing this. And I'm gonna actually write an extra line of code in here just to make it a little bit clearer. I'm gonna add a, a parameter here, offline equals, or online, I should say not offline, online equals true, because I think that will help a little bit. So. In this example, we have, we have a, a very simple skeleton code for a program. And the program will read up some data into a Pandas or Spark, PySpark data frame. And it could, for example, read that data from the data lake or from uh, an existing database. We'll do our feature engineering. So maybe we're gonna compute an aggregate on, on a particular column, or we're going to um, you know, normalize a, a, a numerical feature, or we're going to uh, one-hot encode a, a, a bar chart. But we're basically gonna do this feature engineering on those features and then store that data frame in here in the feature store. And we're gonna give it a name in the feature store. And then if we want to sync it between online and offline, offline is true by default, but you just write down online equals true. And now it will then um, write those features to both the online and offline feature stores. There are many more parameters in here. You can look up the API. There are other operations, like you can have um, an upsert on a feature group. Upsert means insert or update. Uh, you can also delete, and um, you can uh, update as well, of course. And I think there's overwrite as well in the new API. So we, what we've covered here in the feature store is we've covered this part, the data engineering part, where and we showed a coded example of where we, we get our data into the feature store. So the users we said are gonna be online applications that, that want to get features for serving, but also um, users who want to create, data scientists who want to create training test data sets and batch applications as well. So let's have a look at, at, at the user side of things, the data scientist side of things. So data scientists, um, as I gave you an example earlier of the Titanic problem, the data scientist wants to join together a bunch of features to create a train and test data set. So the, these are the features here. And there is a very simple API, which has assumes a flat namespace of features um, that you can use to do this. And this is good for a nice example to show here. But if you have a more complex example, maybe where you have many features that have the same name across different feature groups, you might want to scope this by feature group um, and also by the version because feature groups can be updated. So you can, you can drop, uh, if you make a schema breaking change to a feature group, if you drop, for example, a, a feature, well, now you have a new version of the, of the schema of a feature group. Well, it's not compatible with the old version of the schema, uh, the feature group. So, in that case, you might need to say, well, I want this feature from this feature group, but this version of the feature group. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit because um, what you get back then when you've specified your features is you get back a data frame. And this data frame, we can then simply materialize in the file format we want. And it will automatically give you a version, an immutable version for that training test data set, or you can specify your own version. So um, that's the, the data scientists and how they use a feature store. What about the online applications? What do they do? 
So we have an online application down here, and this online application takes in some user data. So the user is going to enter some information. Maybe it's going to order a product or something like that. And um, we're going to have a, a user ID available to us, and we'll have maybe a session ID, so a shopping cart ID as well. So with these IDs, when the application starts, what it actually does is it goes to the feature store and says, "Hey, I'm going to um, I'm going to I'm going to make predictions with with this particular model, which was trained on this training data set. So here's the name of the training data set. Can you please give me back a prepared statement, GDPC prepared statement, and I can fill it in with that user ID and session ID, and you're going to give me back what we call the feature vector. Right? That's the set of all the features. So maybe it's going to have um, counts of the number of items I've added to the to this um, shopping cart in the last five minutes, the last 15 minutes, the last hour. Um, maybe my historical transactions that I've uh, made with this uh, company or products I've bought. Uh, all these features that will help make predictions um, we'll get back in, in this uh, prepared statement that we send down to the online feature store. And we do that, of course, securely. And what we get back is a feature vector. And that feature vector we can then send to our model. And the model doesn't need to be hosted on the same server even. It can be hosted in our case in Kubernetes on a, on a Docker container. And that could be, for example, a TensorFlow model running TensorFlow serving server, and you'll get back your prediction. So the great thing about this is that, that this is a fully scale out architecture. You can, our database MySQL cluster can be run in highly available mode, even across availability zones. Um, so in Google Cloud, you can run it across three different availability zones. And if one availability zone goes down, or even if two go down, um, the system can, can reconfigure to use the, 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 the remaining uh, database instance that's running. And the same is true, of course, for the model server. And this is low latency and HA. So this is for real production uh, operational use. Okay, so that's the, the basic introduction to the feature store. Um, and I'll show a little bit of how you use it in context. But I'm, I said we'd talk about Kubeflow and how Kubeflow uses the feature store, but also Hadoop. Now, Hadoop, I'm not going to go into in the same detail and, and on-premise clusters, but if you do have a Spark cluster, um, so it could be an, uh, it, it doesn't have to be a Hadoop cluster, it could be there are other vendors who have uh, Spark engines, um, you can access the feature store as well. But so pretty much everything I, I say for, for Kubeflow applies to other platforms that, that either can run Python code, which is Kubeflow, or can run Spark code, so PySpark or Scala Spark. So having said that, Kubeflow is a, an open source framework uh, that's layered on top of the Kubernetes uh, resource management engine. And what it deals with mostly is how do I manage models for machine learning? So how do I train models? How do I serve models? How do I um, do things like hyperparameter optimization? It doesn't deal particularly much with data. So Kubeflow doesn't mandate a, a there's no feature store there. There's no uh, mandated file system. Um, and it provides a web UI as well. So in the demo I do later, I'm going to use the managed Kubeflow uh, platform on GCP, Google Cloud. Uh, but you can install Kubeflow to open source on any on-premise cluster or in any other cloud, um, so AWS or Azure. So um, having said that, Kubeflow, uh, what I'm going to show today is just going to show a notebook that we run in, in Kubeflow. And that notebook will be used to do what data scientists typically will do, is they'll go to the feature store. And they'll say, hey, I want to look at the features that are available. I want to um, create some training data. So I'm going to create some training test data. Now, um, you can create that training test data on any file system you want. I'm going to create it just on, on, on our file system, HopsFS, which is a HDFS compliant file system. So you can, in TensorFlow, you have native support for HDFS. You can go ahead and, and read the model and same for pandas. You can read up uh, the data from HDFS and train in your model. But you could also store this data in, in GCS and in Google Cloud Platform or in any other object store with an S3 compatible API. OK. So um, just a reminder, Fabio is on the chat. If you have any technical questions, just go to chat. This is like an, an he's like my other brain, and he can he knows more details. He's the main guy behind the, this feature store, so he he'll be able to handle any level of uh, technical questions you throw at him. Okay, 
So uh, that's Kubeflow, and, and the same goes, as I said, for, for on-premise uh, machine learning platforms like based on, on, on Hadoop or, or even other platforms that have Python support. So how do we, how do we embed our feature store into an end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning pipeline? And although our platform do itself, you can do with our open source platform, you can do all of this end-to-end, -end. Uh, we do get a lot of customers and users who just use it for the feature store. So it is a modular platform, you can deploy it and just use this feature store and you're fine and good to go. Um, the feature engineering you can do, and I'll take the Hadoop example first, because we have customers who do this. They have a large Hadoop cluster that runs Spark, so a Cloudera cluster, and there's a lot of compute resources on it and they wanna use them naturally. So what they do is they'll basically export a certificate and some jars from our platform. So we have a certificate and we get some jars and they run their Spark application then. Um, and it, it, we set in a couple of environment variables to point them to, uh, in this case, the, our, if, if we're using Hive, it'll point to the Hive um, server too, but also to our file system because it's going to um, store the engineered features on our, on our uh, file system. FS, and then Hive will create the tables on top of that, that data. So you can do feature engineering in an external Hadoop cluster and that's very popular. You could also do it in Kubeflow. Um, Kubeflow is, is, is very Python centric, so you don't have support for Spark. You don't have support for um, even Beam, which is, uh, runs on, on Google Cloud. So if your data is not that big, um, you might be fine to, to use Kube, uh, a, a notebook or, or a Kubeflow pipeline. Uh, to do your feature engineering and then it can um, write to the feature store. So I'll, I'll do an example of it later so that we can see how we connect to the feature store from, from Kubeflow. Um, after your data is in the feature store, what you will typically want to do is what we talked about earlier, which was that you would like to train, uh, create some training test data. So this is our kind of our first step here. We have this one here, number one. Um, we're gonna select the features, typically from the offline feature store, uh, create this training test data set. And then this might be notebook number one here. So we might have just a notebook that does that in, in, in Kubeflow or a single Kubeflow pipeline that just does that as its first stage. And then you have a model that you want to train. So then you have another stage in your Kubeflow pipeline or a notebook, and it will read the, um, the training test data, which has been feature engineered and it's ready to be used directly in your model. You train your model, and then any Kubeflow pipeline should have another uh, stage to analyze and validate the model before you store it in a model repository. So when your model is in a model repository, it's versioned as a name, it's searchable, then you can have batch applications that, that can use the model directly. Uh, or if you're deploying your model for use by uh, an online application over the network, you might have something like, um, uh, we, I'm gonna, we have TensorFlow serving server in our platform and also, of course, scikit-learn, um, TensorFlow serving server. And here, that model that's being served um, is probably not enough by itself. You still need to, to be able to get the feature vectors from the uh, feature store because we have a lot of historical features here that the applications don't have. So these will... In our case, typically you'll go, you'll retrieve them to the online application that will then build a feature vector sent to the model. You have some scenarios where um, the model itself can go to the feature store. I'm sorry, I just jumped out of there. So the model itself can go to the feature store. You can embed the code there to, to, to pull out the feature vector and then um, send the, 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 the feature vector locally to the model. Um, but typically we, we would see this done in the application. But the flexibility is there to do it in both. Okay, I'm gonna do a demo and I'm gonna go through the platform and I'm gonna um, show you what I set up and this is how you can do this on Google Cloud Platform today. So what I have is I have a single Google Cloud Platform project. I think my one's called Hops. And um, I picked a region and the region was EU West. West. Um, I don't remember the number, it might've been one, but it might've been five as well. Uh, I think it was one, right? And then we have a zone inside there, which was like West 1D, I think, something like that. So what I've done already, and I'm not gonna go through it in here, is uh, setting up a Kubeflow, a managed Kubeflow uh, instance. Now I did enable OAuth 2 uh, support for this. 
And Hopsworks Enterprise also has support for OAuth 2. And if you want to have OAuth 2 support for all of this, um, you've got to talk to Logical Clocks um, because Hopsworks Enterprise um, has support for OAuth 2 and um, Active Directory and uh, connectors. But what you can do if you want to try this out, you can deploy the community version and um, do all of this on the Hopsworks feature store yourself. So um, what I did was I deployed Hopsworks Enterprise in the Hopsworks in the same region and zone as, as Kubeflow. And uh, then we, um, we made, the, in this case, the ports for the, the feature store that, that our Jupyter Notebook and Kubeflow need to access um, actually, they're, they're contactable directly. So you can set up a, a firewall around them to, to maybe just decide on which particular ports you want to make available. And in our managed cloud version on, a, on AWS, Hopsworks AI, that's all handled for you. But in this case, you'll need to set up the, the, um, the, the, the firewall yourself. So there's firewall rules that you have in, in GCP that you can configure. Okay, so um, this is a marketing kind of uh, background, so I'm not going to go through any of this. Uh, you can peruse it later. Uh, let's go to the demo. And in the demo, um, I'm going to just give you an overview of the feature store, how we do things like access control, governance statistics. I will have a look at how we connect Kubeflow to the feature store. And um, um, I run, it's not an S3, I created a trained data set you know, from Kubeflow, so let's just delete that. So, um, okay. And we'll mention how the query planner works with hints. So before I jump into the demo, if you want to try out Hopsworks, you have Hopsworks.ai as a managed platform only on AWS currently. And uh, it's point and click. So you can click your way to a cluster within five minutes. And uh, you can connect that directly to platforms like SageMaker and Daybricks. And currently it's free uh, for use and will be for a few months. So I encourage you to, to try that out. Uh, you can also go to Hopsworks Community, which is an uh, open source platform. So it's um, free to use. You don't have to charge us anything. It is a GPL v3 license model. So that means that if you want to build a platform on top of it and sell that platform, um, you should also make your code uh, open source. Uh, but if you just want to use the platform as is without changing it, it's free to use. And then we have Hopsworks Enterprise, and Hopsworks Enterprise has integration with Kubernetes. We run notebooks there, we do model serving there, uh, we add support for authentication on different uh, backend systems, LDAP, Active Directory, OAuth 2, and GitHub support is only in the Enterprise version. So um, otherwise you'd have to hack something together yourself. So uh, you can, if you're interested, um, all our work is on GitHub, so you can go directly to GitHub. There are loads of notebooks I think there's over 100 notebooks on hops-examples in here. So if you go to logical clocks slash hops-examples, uh, you, can, you can look through all the notebooks there, which is a, a great resource. And then you can follow us on, on Twitter um, to get latest updates on what's happening. So I'm gonna go to, um, this is the platform here. I think I should probably log out. Uh, I span this up with a script. I'm gonna actually show you the script. and. This is a little bit of a preview script because we just released a new version of the platform this week, 1.3. And um, this is kind of a new way of doing it. Um, but you can spin up a cluster. Uh, let me see, Caramel Chef, uh, Cloud GCP. So if you, if, you, um, if you check out this Caramel Chef GitHub repo, um, let's see here, okay. Uh, this is how I spun up the cluster. Uh, you can, you can run a, a script called setup, which will just set your um, your Google Cloud project and your uh, region and zone. And there is a file here called config.sh, and you can change some of the config here, like your project, the type of image. I think we default to eight CPUs. Um, and if you're going to use GPUs, you can decide to use those ones there. So if you just want to spin up PopSorts really quickly, just go install CPU community. And then if you run that, it will uh, use your, you have to have Google Cloud tools installed, of course, and it will install uh, a platform for you. Okay, so, uh, and, and you wanna set the zone and the region to be the same as GCP. So that's basically what I did. Now I installed the, the enterprise version, which you'll need to contact us if you want to install. Um, but what it did was it basically spun up a three node cluster here, right? 
right, so it's actually not this one, because let's just kill this one, because I don't need it. Well, we don't need to kill it. Um, but I, I, it's this GPU Europe West 1, CPU Europe West 1, and this CLU Europe West 1. So that's my HopSorts cluster. And we have a, a, Kuben, um, a Kubeflow cluster, and it's these two um, VMs here. And you can see that they're also in Europe West 1D. So I have Europe West 1D, Europe West 1D, Europe West 1D, and this other one is just a stray instance I ran at some other time. So um, let's go to Kubeflow. So if you haven't seen Kubeflow, this, I have Kubeflow open in two places. Yeah, so let's just close one. So this is Kubeflow here. And um, Kubeflow looks something like this. You have um, lots of notebooks. You have Kubeflow pipelines. These are jobs you can use to, to compute, um, uh, to do feature engineering, for example, or to train models. Uh, but you can also run notebooks. Now, there, there's a little bit more to Kubeflow. You have hyperparameter optimization and this artifact store, which I haven't really understood what it is yet. Um, but what I did was I just I started a notebook. And I, I gave it quite a small notebook with two CPUs and only two gigabytes of memory. So um, I, this was the one I was running earlier on. And um, this is what I get. So I actually wrote this notebook called dash feature store I'll just talk you through the notebook before I show you the HopSorts feature store so you get an idea of how it works in Kubeflow. So I needed to install this library, which uh, is a library you use in a non-Spark environment. So if you have a Spark environment, we have a different library called Hops. But if you're in SageMaker or in Kubeflow or in, in for example, Cloudera, um, the, the data science workbench, then you would use this particular um, library. So this library, is a, it's a normal Python library. And uh, then I need to import the feature store from the hops library, and then I call feature store.connect. Now it's using the private IP because I'm inside the same uh, project, inside the same uh, per perimeter security environment. And then this is actually the name of the feature store I'm connecting to. Uh, I actually installed uh, without um, a, a uh, with a self signed certificate. I didn't get around to putting in a proper certificate, so I just set this to be false. And then to connect to the feature store, I'm actually using a file. So I took an API key that we generated from our platform, and I'll show you how to do that now. And uh, then I say the secret store is a local file. So that's how it's actually going to connect. So let's generate the API key just so that you get an idea. This is uh, the Hopsworth, This is the Hopsworks platform. I'm just going to sign out and show you how to sign in. Um, so I just sign in and. In here, I have two projects. So there, you can think of it as being a two feature stores, a development and a production one. And I can generate my API key here from the settings option up here. So in here, I have um, an API key. And this was the Kubeflow one I think I created. And this other one, I think, I, oh, I, uh, yeah, those are earlier this evening. Um, so you can create a new one. Let's call it the, the webinar. And you basically, in this case, Kubeflow will also want to start jobs for creating training data sets. So I'm going to give it that scope. And then the feature store, but the feature store is inside the project, so we need to give it the project scope as well. So when you create this API key, it won't be stored anywhere. It's just going to appear in your browser. That's what that warning box is telling you. So we're just going to copy it. So what I did in this particular case, and in a production setting, you probably want to make put this somehow securely on a, a volume that you auto mount with your um, with your notebooks, and, and obviously it's per user, so this, this identifies me as a user, and um, so it'll be on my individual volume, and keep the permissions of that file um, uh, so that it's not group or world readable. But what you can do in here is I can, uh, as a really hacky way to get started, you can just go to a terminal, and in your terminal you can just uh, edit a file. That's what I did. I just went edit key.txt, and we can call it like um, this is webinar.txt. And then we can just dump our key in there, save it, and um, the permissions of it are okay. So um, you can see they have this Jovan user that's um, created in, in, in uh, Kubo. So this is world readable, that's not good. So we can just go sage mod, um, we want, uh, let's go 500 webinar.txt. Okay. And, uh, and there we have our file. Okay, so now it's not world readable, which is a lot better. So now we've created an API key where Kubeflow can go ahead and connect to the feature store. Let's look at, at our tab we had open earlier on. I'm going to run some of these just so that we can see it. I think this one, let's close that. So um, 
So uh, I think it's safe enough just to reinstall that library. It doesn't really make a difference. And now I've imported the feature store and it connects. Um, we can just double check that it connected okay. We can just run the next piece of code to check to make sure. It's, it's going to the feature store to get a, a feature group called Teams Features. I can show you that one in a second. And um, it's running that code um, uh, as a, a SQL query against feature store on our platform. And it's just doing a head on, on the first five results coming back. So what we can do here is we, we're doing our data, uh, our exploratory data um, uh, analysis here. Um, I, can, we, I can just show you some other examples. Things you might do are, are visualize feature group distributions on uh, a feature group. And uh, you can create training data sets that I have here. Um, but let's have a quick look at this example. So the, 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 the feature groups that I have here are ones that were created when I installed Hopsworks and I ran this thing here called the, the feature store tour. So if you click on that button, when you log into the platform, there'll be nothing here, this will be empty. You'll have zero projects. And uh, you click on the feature store button, it will create this particular project here. There you go, uh, number one, this one here. And uh, this will have a bunch of pre-created uh, feature groups, so you can kind of get started and play around with each store and understand how, to, how that works. And a bunch of notebooks, of course. I think there's about 20 or 30 notebooks there. If you want more notebooks, um, this Deep Learning Project has uh, maybe 60 or 70 notebooks for, for training models. So you can do that as well in the platform after you use the feature store to, to create training test data sets. You can also train models in the platform. Um, and just on that note, we do have GPUs. This, this particular machine has a GPU, and uh, you can have GPUs um, uh, use as many as you can afford to put in your cluster to train those models. But let's concentrate on the feature store. So in the feature store here, I clicked on the project, and I had two projects, you notice, and I mentioned that one is like the dev project, and one is like the, the prod uh, feature store. But these these projects are actually uh, sandboxes, complete sandboxes. So uh, if I have a feature store here and I run some code, a job inside this feature store, I don't actually have permissions to copy the data to the other feature store, even though I'm maybe a member of it. Uh, what, it what it's actually doing is it's what we call project-based multi-tenancy. I have a different user running the code here, I have a different certificate for the user in this project. And when I want to read data from another project or copy data to another project, it'll say, no, that's a different user. You know, you're, you're a member of that other project. Now, that could be a problem. You'd say, well, I want to maybe share the production features in the, in the, the group feature store, so our production features. So I want to share those with the development one because I want to debug my, my, my new feature. I'm developing a new feature. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to this other dev feature store here and say, okay, I've got this development feature store. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to now create some features. There's no feature groups, there's no trained data sets, there's no features. It's empty, look at it, it's empty. What, um, I'm going to create a new feature, put it in here, but I'd like to join features in the existing feature store with this new one to make sure everything works as I expect. So what I've done already is I've um, shared that feature store, the group one with this. You can do it securely. So even though we have the sandbox model, um, what I did earlier on was that I, um, I went to this data sets tab here, and then I took this feature store. This is the feature store for this project, and I can go share. I just say share with another project. And um, in that case, you pick your project, and, um, and I shared it, okay? So that was this one here that got shared with me. And we can see if we look in this feature store, oh, look, there's uh, four different uh, feature groups in there. So now within this feature store, I have the ability to read from the production feature store, but I can also develop my own ones. And what we, if we want to go from dev to production, what we typically will do is we'll have a feature pipeline that we point at dev. And when you're ready to move to production, you'll ask a data engineer or somebody responsible for production to run that pipeline. So they'll be responsible for running that pipeline, pointing at a prod and ingesting that feature and backfilling the feature group um, uh, that way. So I'm gonna talk about this, uh, th this uh, demo feature store that, that we have that's created. You can see it's, it's being, I'll give you the details. It just has 24 features, six feature groups, three data, data sets. Actually removed one of them earlier on, uh, one of the feature groups. Um, but these feature groups are, uh, I can click on one. It's called player features. And we can see there's a bunch of buttons here. I can look at statistics, um, preview data. So I can see, get a preview of what data is in here. Um, and you can see here's a bunch of uh, sample data. That's great if you're a data scientist, you always want to see that. And I can ask for more data here than the 20 rows it showed me. 
um, we can, if we go back to player features, we can um, do, uh, we can look at the uh, feature correlation. So this is again exploratory data analysis. You can see the uh, not really strongly correlated features, so none of them to drop. There's some clustering of the of, of uh, our features. The descriptive statistics is is always quite useful. How many rows are there of a given feature? Um, what is the average mean value, the standard deviation, the min and max values? And this is all pretty useful because this helps you understand uh, the data um, as a data scientist before you actually go ahead and decide to use a given feature. And then I think, of course, things like the distribution of feature values. This is the ages of the feature of the uh, players in this data set. Now, um, what you also might want to do is say, well, okay, um, I like this. And I, I, we also support validating the data in the feature with the UI. So um, th this is mainly because the, the tool that we provide, the framework we provide called DQ, which is actually an Amazon DQ. It's an Amazon library. It's a Scala only library. And it works on Spark, but it doesn't work uh, on PySpark. So what we do is we provide a UI to allow you to run uh, a bunch of these data validation rules against um, your feature groups. So I can say, well, for this feature group, I want an error if this um, the size of it is is not is outside this range. So these are effectively predicates I'm defining in my data, and I might say for a given um, a given feature. I expect, I'll say the, the player age, I expect at I expect all of them to be there. So it's going to be at least 1.0 and uh, most 1.0. And I want an error if it's missing, for example. So I can create a, a job out of that. And that job that I'm creating, um, it will basically, I have one already here. I actually did create, it did create that job. That's this one. That was one I had open already, actually. And so this is the job it created. And, and if I run that job, it'll basically then validate those features. And What's nice about the platform is we do support, uh, these jobs can be run in Airflow um, uh, workflows. So what I could do is I could say, okay, I'm gonna create a new uh, Airflow workflow to ingest my data and validate it. And, uh, and, and, and then I'm happy with it. If it's, if it's validated, then I can move it somewhere else, for example. So I'm just gonna call this validate. Um, and I can basically pick those jobs that are in there. I can just say, okay, well, the first job is going to be, um, not that one, we'll just pick a random one here. Um, maybe it's the feature store tour job. And then the next one after that job, um, I'm putting them in our shopping cart and adding up these jobs is our uh, data validation on the player feature. Okay. And only run that after the, you know, the first job of importing the data is correct. So now, now what it'll do is it'll, it'll create an Airflow program. We call it a DAG in Airflow. Very simple Airflow program that you can schedule to run um, periodically or when something an event happens. And data scientists who write Python code actually are okay with this typically. They'll, they'll look at this and go, that's fine code. I can, I can manage that. I can send a message on Slack if this goes well or send a message in by email if it doesn't go well. Um, and, and then you can run that in Airflow. So you can run it within the platform or if you have your own Airflow cluster, you can do that as well. Um, I can show you that in Airflow here. Um, so the, um, the, the actual, okay, it's giving me a little warning there for some reason. And um, let's go back to the feature store. So that's kind of uh, how we can do data validation for a given feature group. Um, these are training data sets that are here already. And we didn't go through all of it in Kubeflow, but um, I did actually run this earlier and I created a training data set. So we got this far. But in Kubeflow, I can go ahead and, and join a bunch of features together. Here we have a list of features. And um, what I did was this feature list, you can see it here. I basically, um, I, I called create training data set on, on, on that particular list of, of, uh, of features. And what it does is it will then start a job in the platform, which will create the training data set. So that particular job, which ran here earlier, I think it was this one, create training data set um, players. And then the training data set ended up, it's in, in, in our particular platform, it, it actually stores it in here in training data set. So we have um, this data is available and you can get the path to it in HDFS and you can access this actually from even from Kubeflow. If you want to, um, you'll have to put in the, the name of, the, of our platform in, in the path, but otherwise, it, you can read it from Kubeflow um, because we, we, you just need to have our library and then the API key that we had earlier and a certificate. Okay, so um, that's training data sets created. So what else can we do in the feature store? So the feature store is kind of like a data warehouse, okay? 
And if you have a data warehouse, um, what you might want to do in a data warehouse is you might want, here you can see jobs for it that was used to compute this feature. But what you might want to do in your, in your data warehouse is you might want to organize these features. You might want to search for them. You might want to have tags for them. You might want to say that this particular feature is actually uh, sensitive, okay? So I can add tags uh, to, to feature groups or to training data sets. And um, I can add free text uh, tags here. So I can just say this is uh, Natalia who owns this. And in this way, I can basically, like in a, in a data warehouse, I can do metadata management for, for groups of features. I can tag them so that later on, and you can get at these feature groups and features through an API if you want to use it. We have library support and a REST API for this. But often what you might want to do is you might want to search for them in free text. So we mentioned earlier that you have dev and you have prod feature stores and you might have a sensitive feature store with, with features that you don't want to share with the whole organization or group. So what you can do from here is I can search for a NAT and I just say, well, what did NAT do in, the, in, in recent past? And you can see I got a uh, hit and the tag that matches Natalia that I wrote, it's a partial match. And this is not hitting our production database. This is hitting uh, Elasticsearch. But in the background, we actually index all of uh, this metadata in Elasticsearch so that you can search it in um, uh, uh, with free text search and also that it won't affect the production system. And this is a lot of work that we've done in the background to make that, that work efficiently. Um, but you know, so you can search for anything in the description or the tags. It's not restricted to or the names of the features or feature groups or the training data sets. So we have this kind of global way of enabling you to find the features easily that may potentially be spread across more than one feature store. And it's a really nice new feature that, that we've added to the platform. I should add that tagging is only in the uh, enterprise version. You have storage connectors here, I haven't mentioned. So a storage connector for an S3 platform, uh, for, sorry, for, for any file system, um, you, you put in the name of your storage connector. So maybe it's uh, GCS or let's say it's S3, it's a bucket, some bucket, my bucket. And um, you give a name for it and then you, you put in the name of your bucket and optionally you can put in an access key and a secret key. But, in, in AWS, you typically would uh, use a, an IAM role, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't put in an access key or CPK. And the same is true for, um, for Google Cloud, you would typically use a service account rather than um, an access key and so on. So, yeah, okay. It's not actually running on S3, so it's not gonna validate that. But with that connector, I can basically use that connector in my code to say, store my training data in this bucket, for example. And then the, uh, we have to configure HopSource to have a service account in GCP that's able to write to that bucket. Um, but if you do that, then it will create the uh, training test data set in that bucket. Okay, this is popping down here. Okay, so um, I've kind of done, gone through most of the, the overview of the feature store. Um, I haven't gone through all the notebooks. I'm gonna show you, show you where all these notebooks are that I mentioned earlier. I'm just gonna Google for Hopstash examples. And GitHub gives me uh, a hint here. And if I go to notebooks in here and feature store, um, these notebooks will all be created in this demo project that we had earlier on. And uh, you can use, I mean, I, if you were starting out with just Hopsworks, you can just use Jupyter notebooks in Hopsworks itself. You don't have to run them from Kubeflow. You can just go in here, start a, a classic Jupyter or Jupyter lab notebook and give it the resources that you want, and even GPUs, which is really nice. So you can just say, okay, I want a GPU in here, and a bit more memory for this experiment. And if you're doing hyperparameter optimization, we can do parallel experiments if you have more than one GPU. Um, but you can do, run these notebooks from within Hopsworks, or as we said, from, from uh, Kubeflow or, or any external platform that has either Spark or Python support. So, um, Let's have a quick look at it. I mentioned S3 as an example, um, but the same is true for, for GCP. Um, in, in the case of, uh, of, of S3, if you have an S3 API to your object store, you can import a feature group. It, you can import data from a bucket. So if you have, for example, data already in CSV format in a bucket in your file system, you can import that directly into the feature store. You just give it a name, a version, and now it's in your feature store and it can be used directly. 
Um, other things you can do is you can obviously write to buckets. So we can, in this case, we can um, uh, create a training data set. And in this case, I have sync as, as the name of the connector. So this connector can point to your, to your object store and then that training data set will be created in that object store for you. Okay, so um, other things that are in the platform that aren't related directly, we do manage models and there's a model repository here and then um, we manage experiments and um, then we have these jobs that we talked about already that can be uh, either run directly and even you know if you don't like the notion of using um, uh, Airflow, you can, you can schedule jobs from here as well. We can just go to the job and say, okay, I want to run this before I get to work in the morning. So I want to run it once a day, and I'm going to run it um, at, uh, I'm going to pick a date, I'm going to start from tomorrow, and I'm going to uh, set it at that time. I actually, I don't remember what time it's set, so let's have a look at the time again. So uh, yeah, you can see it's going to run at, at, at this current time, uh, my local time here. Uh, but you can change that time to be the, you know, four in the morning, so, so that the new training data set is available at, immediately when you get to work, which is always really nice. Okay, uh, I think we're, we're, we're running out of time. So um, I'm gonna wrap up with this and I'll just remind you that if you wanna try out the platform, there is the managed platform at Hopsworks AI. It is open source. Um, I gave you, there are, I didn't point you at the documentation. So if you just Google Hopsworks, and if I'd say read the docs, um, you'll get uh, documentation for the platform. And we go to 1.3, which is um, the most recent version. And there is, uh, in the getting started section, we have how to get started on um, on-premise, I think as well. So let's go installation here somewhere. We've got on-premise installation. Now the script I showed you earlier on um, would create a virtual machine and it would then, uh, it basically creates a virtual machine and creates a cluster definition and then runs this script. But if you have an existing virtual machine, so if you're an open stack or um, if you have just a bare metal machine, you can actually just run these three lines to install the platform. And this installer will uh, step you through. So it will install locally on the machine you're running the script on. Um, it can be used to install on multiple machines as well, but you need to configure them a bit to, to do multi-host uh, uh, installation with that script. Um, behind the scenes, it's using a, a tool called Caramel and uh, Chef to actually orchestrate and do the installation. So it can take quite a while, you know, maybe an hour to do an install on a single machine. Okay, I'm going to finish up there. Um, we're at the end, of, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I don't, I hope Fabio has answered all the questions. I don't know if I need to answer any more. Maybe Natalia, you have some uh, feedback. Hi, Jim. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, Fabio did a great job answering lots of questions we got today. Uh, but feel free, guys, to send us questions later on. You, just a reminder, you will receive the video and the slides of the presentation after the webinar. Uh, and there you're going to have our contact. So if you have any extra question, you can contact us. Thank you for staying with us until the end. And we hope to see you in the next webinar. Great. Uh, just one more point before we drop off, community.hopsearch.ai. That's where you can get um, questions on, on uh, you can ask your questions directly to us. That's currently where we're, we're pointing people. So go there. We got a question about when's our next webinar. On our website, logicalclocks.com, there is a uh, tab where you can go webinars. You're going to see all the scheduled webinars and also the previous ones. Okay, thank you so much for everyone who attended the webinar and have a good evening or a good afternoon depending where you are. Thanks, bye.